everyone. This is your last video for our lecture on Tuesday. And so where we left off last time was talking about the fact that ATP is not the only high energy compound that we have within our metabolites. So our metabolites are what we refer to as the substrates and products within metabolism. So um, essentially anything can be referred to as a high energy compound or an energy rich compound as long as they have group transfer potential equal to or greater than ATP. So what group are we transferring? Typically we are going to be transferring a phosphate group. And low energy compounds would be those that are lower in energy than ATP. Okay, so we have three specific compounds that are higher in energy than our ATP. One being phosphoenol pyruvate, and the next being 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate. And so both of these are compounds found in glycolysis. And we'll get to that in a few days, probably Thursday. All right, so here we see creatine phosphate is above ATP. So where does that come into play? Well, creatine phosphate helps provide us energy once we've depleted our ATP reserves within the first few seconds of needing energy, okay? So typically muscle builders are going to take creatine and this is our, what they're using to provide energy for themselves. So when we are exercising within the first few seconds, we're going to start utilizing all of our ATP and our ATP reserves get depleted after a few seconds. And once that occurs, our creatine phosphate is going to be utilized until we get to the point where we can start creating energy from our metabolism. So our ATP and our creatine phosphate are kind of our reserve energy supply for once we can start breaking down our other molecules to get energy. Okay, so that kind of um, so this goes back to what we talked about with lipid metabolism, okay? So essentially, um, the big idea is that the more places that we have to oxidize a carbon, the more energy we get out of that molecule, okay? So our carbohydrates, we have a bunch of alcohols and um, not a lot of places for oxidation to occur because we have a lot of ox uh, alcohols and oxygens already located there. And so the less places we have for oxidation, the lower amount of energy that we can yield from that molecule. And so this is why our carbohydrates get converted for long-term storage to our lipids because our lipids are highly reduced, meaning that it has a lot of hydrogens on it and places that we can add oxygens to oxidize it, okay? Um, and so how do we get our ATP? Well, it's through a um, combination of oxidation reactions. So this is where we're going to utilize that combustion reaction, right, of our carbohydrate plus oxygen yield CO2, water, and energy. And that energy that we're forming for metabolism is ATP. All right, so energy isn't the only thing that is we have to take into account, okay? Um, one of the ways in which we get this energy is through these molecules referred to as activated carriers. And activated carriers carry various things. So the first set that we're going to look at are carriers of electrons, okay? So if they are going to provide electrons, then that means that they can be oxidized and reduced. All right, so what's going to happen is um, we have two examples of uh, carriers of electrons. The first is NAD plus, 
this is going to be reduced to provide electrons to something else. Okay, so our NAD plus is going to get reduced to NADH, reduced because it gains hydrogens. And the place, this is our NAD plus molecule. So you can see that it has our adenine, our ribose, and our phosphate. Okay, that's our backbone of an AD, adenine diphosphate. Okay, and then it has another ribose with a um, nicotinamide molecule attached. And the nicotinamide is where we're going to do our oxidation reduction. Okay, so if we look at this specific site, what we see is we are going to add and take away our hydrogen here to get our NADH. Where we're going to see NADH as a coenzyme is going to be reactions where we are oxidizing fuels. Typically, we're going to take a alcohol and we're going to convert it to a carbonyl. So if you see the addition of oxygens by or oxygen bonds from an alcohol to a carbonyl, NAD plus is involved. Why do we need coenzymes? So a molecule that helps enzymes do oxidation reduction. Well, remember, our enzymes have to remain the same from beginning to end, right? That's part of the definition of being a catalyst. And so if the enzyme catalyzes an oxidation reaction, that means that the substrate is oxidized, that would mean that the enzyme would have to be reduced. And therefore, it would no longer be the same as how it started. So small molecules are added as a coenzyme to provide for that reduction to occur. And so that's the role that NAD plus plays. FAD also plays the same function, except for in this case, the reaction that we're going to catalyze is the removal of two hydrogens. So an alkane going to an alkene is the reaction that FAD um, catalyzes. And so this is the molecule of FAD. Again, we have an ADP molecule attached to a straight chain ribose and a flavin molecule at the top. So if you've heard of riboflavin, this is what this blue part is, okay? And we refer to this as flavin adenine dinucleotide, not as what FAD stands for. And so Again, the reactive sites are on our flavin molecule up here. And so what we're going to do is add hydrogens to the nitrogens in this conjugated ring system to provide for our oxidation reduction to occur. All right, so if we have molecules that oxidize our substrates, we also have coenzymes that help reduce our enzymes or reduce our substrates. And so NADPH is an example of such a molecule. And so NADPH is typically found in the biosynthesis of fatty acids. It's also found in the synthesis of biomolecules, okay? And so we have the same overall structure as NAD, but instead of an OH down here on the initial ribose, we've added a phosphate group. And so we have the exact same chemistry that's occurring in NAD, where we have a hydrogen being um, added to our nicotinamide molecule. All right. Those are our electron carriers. We also have a carrier that adds two carbons to our molecules. And this is referred to as coenzyme A. And coenzyme A is, adds acyl groups to our molecules, okay? So again, we see this ADP, so hopefully you're picking up that this is a really important molecule for metabolism. We have a pentothal pantothenoate molecule, which is a type of B vitamin, and then we have a beta mercaptoethylamine 
at the end. And this um, thiol group is where the uh, acyl group can come in. And so this, when we have the two carbon unit attached, this is what we refer to as acyl-CoA versus acetyl-CoA. So if we look at the difference between these molecules, okay, if we have a thiol or an ester group here, we have um, resonance structures, okay? And so this would be more stable and it wouldn't allow us to break off this um, acyl group as readily as if we have the thioester group, okay? The thioester, we don't get this resonance stabilization. And so it's easier to break off our acyl chain or our two oxygens. So that's why we see this thiol group here as opposed to our alcohol group due to the increase in energy and the less stable of an ester. All right, so these are various different kinds of um, activated carriers. So we see the ATP, that's a carrier for our phosphoryl group. These we've already talked about, they carry electrons. And what you'll notice is that a lot of these carrier groups also have vitamin precursors. And what you see is that a lot of these are actually B vitamins. All right, so let's go ahead and talk a little bit about vitamins. So our vitamins are small, typically they're molecules that help uh, provide chemistry for our body, okay? Um, how, so a little bit of history on this. Uh, how they were initially coded was that a grad student was tasked in determining what all these vitamins were. So the easiest way to separate things were to determine what are water soluble and what are not water soluble. And so from there, we got two test tubes, right? We got the stuff that were water soluble and the stuff that were not. So our A would be not water soluble and our B would be water soluble. And those were put in two separate test tubes. And so that's where we get A vitamins versus B vitamins. B were water soluble. And so they were put in the B test tube. All right, so if we look at the B vitamins, these are all referred to as coenzymes. They help our enzymes do chemistry. And these are all of the different types of reactions, the types of chemistry that are associated with the, with the vitamin. So riboflavin we, is associated with FAD. We've already seen that. Nicotiniacin is associated with NAD. Both of these do oxidation reduction, but we have other vitamins as well, okay? So you need to be familiar, look at your learning objective for specifically what you need to be able to do with this information. All right, so other vitamins, so all of the other vitamins are not coenzyme vitamins. They have different functions, okay? So vitamin C is C because it's way easier to analyze uh, molecules that dissolve in water. So C was found next, and this is also water soluble, okay? And it serves as an antioxidant. So it can be oxidized or reduced, um, and sorry, and get, um, and serve as the thing that gets oxidized and reduced as opposed to, let's say, your DNA becoming oxidized or reduced. We'll talk more about that later on in the semester. But vitamins A, D, E, and K, if we look at the overall structures of these molecules, you'll see that there's a lot of hydrocarbon tails and hydrocarbon groups. These are our fat-soluble molecules. And note the structure of vitamin D. It looks a lot like cholesterol. Well, that's the precursor to vitamin D. And how we get vitamin D 
from the sun is that the sun provides the UV radiation necessary, the energy to break this bond of cholesterol, providing vitamin D.